Hello, uh, my name is Connor Lenahan. I'm a medical student and I've created this PowerPoint in conjunction with a variety of other students involved with the Student Diversity Coalition. This presentation is about race essentialism um, and how to abolish that concept of race essentialism from medical curricula. The goals of this presentation are uh, an overview of race and genetics with brief examples. Um, contextual statements on race and my current curriculum, and next steps to address racial inequities proposed by other students and scholars. You'll see in the top right corner some words in italics. That's where I'll be putting sources in that same format throughout the presentation. I also want to credit certain authors like Dorothy Roberts and Harriet Washington, whose books uh, and presentations and other writings have covered uh, much of this in, in much more exacting detail. A word on politics before we start. I'm aware that there's a strong political divide in the United States right now. It's also clear to me that some of the topics mentioned in this PowerPoint are often considered political points and as such are kept quiet or outright ignored uh, for fear of potential controversy or retaliation. However, I would like to state that this presentation, by its very nature, is outside the realm of politics. It is directly related to social justice in its most basic sense, and intended to help in the education of hundreds of student doctors who have the responsibility to provide care to all members of our community. It is that responsibility that has prompted us to create this presentation and will keep us involved in doing the work of first doing no harm. So firstly, uh, genetic information. When is genetic information useful? Genetic information is useful when it can provide individual specific data or inform statistical calculations. Uh, in the first example, we have a female patient who has uh, either the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene, and that leads to an increased risk of developing breast cancer during their lifetime. Similarly, a genetically female patient with a single copy of the colorblindness gene has a 50% chance of passing the gene along to a genetically male child because it is carried on the X chromosome. So here in these examples, we see how uh, genetic information gives us information about the individual and their immediate relatives. In contrast, race does not equal ancestry or genetics. So what is race? Well, historically, race was used to classify groups of people for legal and social distinctions, frequently based on appearance alone. Here, a person is classified as black based on the social definition of what an outwardly appearing black person is at that time. Why does this matter? The development of racial classification was a human-made political and social construct with ill-defined and unstable definitions. Race is a broad categorization scheme that was created without any biological or genetic relevance. However, Utilization of the racial schema penetrated scientific study and became synonymous with ancestry and ethnicity. Now I'd like to walk through a quick example of um, the reality of genetics and race as it exists in the world and what we've been taught or implied uh, during our time in medical school. Uh, so current teachings in medical school have race and genetics as kind of a Venn diagram. They're similar spheres of influence and they overlap. Uh, and that's why the argument is commonly made that while race might not be directly related to genetics, it is somehow related and may be used as a proxy. However, that's not true. As I've mentioned before, genetics is, gives you specific individual level data. Race was a social and political construct. And therefore, by definition, they're touching on different aspects of the political or the scientific fields. Uh, one would be biological science, one would be political science. Uh, so in reality, genetics is a circle that is completely separate from race. Now, I also want to bring your attention to the third diagram, which then appropriately uh, compares these two concepts with scale. So what that means is, again, with genetics, that's individual and uh, family-specific data or sort of uh, immediate relatives and small population data. Race is a much larger construct. It affects all of society. All people exist within a perceived race. So that is something that affects millions of people. In comparison, genetics really 
can, by definition, only apply to a biological population, which is a very small population of genetically homogenous individuals. When we finally look at the final comparison here, scaled down genetics may overlap or intersect with racial divisions because by definition race is a much larger concept and genetics is a very specific concept. So you can have a genetic population that exists either entirely within a racial classification or entirely outside of, but more commonly what we'll see is that genetics overlaps with intersecting definitions of racial categories. And that is where problems begin to arise and the assumption that all genetic categories will fit nicely into a racial category is false. So this brings me to look at regional genetic diversity. So researchers at the human genome have, and, and many other researchers throughout time, have shown that there's actually more genetic diversity within the African diaspora than there are between Africa and Europe or between Africa and Asia, for example. Therefore, classifying all people of African descent under one term implies that they're a homogenous or near homogenous group and that patient-specific genetic information can reliably be assumed for all patients under this category. However, we know that's not true. As I just stated, there's more genetic diversity within the continent of Africa than between the continents, either of Europe and Africa or Asia and Africa, the Americas and Africa. So we know that it's not a homogenous group, and as a result, we can't assume patient-specific genetic information. To give another example of this dynamic, uh, I'll look at the country of Guatemala, which I lived in for two years. Uh, aside from being a beautiful country, it can serve as a good example of ancestral or ethnic groups and how that's distinct from race, especially as it's defined within the United States. This map shows the ethnic groups of Guatemala. There are over 20 Mayan indigenous groups with distinct heritage and ethnicity. There are many European descendants. There are also black populations on the Caribbean coast and on the border with Belize. There are Asian populations as well. As you can see, there's a variety of ethnic backgrounds in Guatemala. These groups in the United States would all be classified as Hispanic. However, there are white European descendants, there are indigenous Mayan and non-Mayan groups, and there are Afro-Caribbean descendants. Their race and ethnicity classification in the U.S., whether that be white Hispanic or non-white Hispanic, does not give any information on their ancestry or how a provider could use that information to direct care. Physician scientists agree. Uh, Dr. Chester Brown, who was recently named one of the most inspiring black scientists, shows in his research that genetics on the continent of Africa are not homogenous. He says here in the abstract, our ab observations reveal a complex but distinct ancestral history and genomic architecture among Botswana and suggest that disease mapping within similar southern African populations will require a deeper repository of genetic variation and allelic dependencies than presently exists. In class, when we discuss the pathophysiology of disease, students need to understand that race is not a biological risk factor, unlike age and sex. We need to emphasize that if there is a racial difference in development, progression, or prognosis of a disease, that the difference cannot be due to genetics. It is most likely due to social determinants of health, and as a result, our research funding and education should focus on understanding and improving those social determinants. Uh, if a disease is related to geographic ancestry, it should be discussed in the context of local populations, not race. So what does race tell us? Race is still important information to understand as a provider in the United States. It gives relevant social information that can be explored to understand the factors that may be leading to a patient's condition. The consistent discrimination and segregation in the United States has led to the development of structural risk factors that will delineate along racial lines. This is directly linked to the history of redlining and other legal and pseudo-legal discrimination. Therefore, race is an important factor in the development and prognosis of diseases, but because it is linked to the way that society is and has been structured. Now, here I have some proposed next steps. Uh, I'll go into each of these in more detail in the following slides. Uh, first, we should change preclinical trainings to acknowledge the distinctions between race and genetics. 
Second, we need to remove race corrections in medical algorithms. I'll explain in a minute. Third, we need to address institutional culture by recruiting new students who are willing to learn and discuss issues of social justice, including racism. Four, create a system that allows students to report instances of unintentional discrimination and work through them with the people that committed those acts. So first, the preclinical curriculum. All current teaching professionals in medicine should first receive trainings on implicit bias and specific institutional biases, especially in relation to race, gender, ability, and weight. Second, they should review all of their materials that specifically reference race and gender. That can be done fairly easily with a control or command F search uh, using those terms. And I think especially with the gender term, that should include a uh, search for the term sex because those things are often misused. Third, they should submit their changes to a qualified professional for approval. And I want to emphasize here, qualified professional. The person who is reviewing this information needs to have received training on what is appropriate in this situation. Second, we need to remove race corrections from our medical algorithms. Because race is not genetic, we should also advocate for the removal of race corrections. These are mathematical adjustments for healthcare that factor in race and lead to structural barriers to accessing care for patients of color. These corrections create and exacerbate harmful outcomes for patients, worsening health access and disparities in treatment. Physician groups should establish a task force to reassess the use of race in all clinical algorithms building on work by the University of Washington and other institutions and practitioners who have researched and written about abolishing race corrections. Third, student interviews. All interested applicants should be able to express a general willingness to learn about the intersection of race, class, and privilege when they are interviewed for medical school. Applicants should already understand that race is a social construct and is not a biological risk factor for disease. Four, we should support current students. Because the average training environment lacks diversity, there must be a system to respond to instances of unintentional discrimination. We know that minority students are more likely to be discriminated against, and that the earlier in the career, and the more often, the less likely that individual is to continue in their career. There needs to be a system in place to encourage students to report instances of abuse, such as microaggressions, and to allow administrators, attendings, and residents to learn from those reported instances. Creating a system in which students can understand how to respond to racism, sexism, or discrimination will help all students to support each other and improve our learning environment. Conclusions. Current medical curricula is reinforcing and exacerbating racial health inequities. The profession can adopt these four measures as steps toward a more anti-racist education. While data supports our assumption that these changes will induce a positive change in our training and in resultant patient outcomes, these suggestions are not intended to be the only action taken by a university for improvement in diversity and inclusion. Rather, these suggestions would best be implemented in conjunction with a variety of other measures to help in addressing intersectional minority identities. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope that this was informative. Uh, if you would like to discuss any of these things more, firstly, I would encourage you to look through some of the sources that I reference. Uh, I think that they're a great resource for anyone. Um, and also, uh, feel free to contact me. What do you think the medical profession should do to address race essentialism in our training? And what are ways that we can create a more anti-racist institution in the training of physicians, of, of doctors. Let's continue the conversation in the comment section below.